Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I learned how to bathe at Santa Maddalena. I have never learned how to bathe before. Um, well, I grew up in South Central Leningrad and in uh, Queens. We didn't have bathtubs. We had this uh, water hose thing for the showering. And uh, so I walk in into this beautiful bathroom, and there it is, a bathtub. And I said, where does this begin? Why don't I crawl in? And Beatrice came, and she showed me how it works. Uh, it was a real education, I think. She also showed me the, the thing that makes the coffee, the silver thing. So I came a boy to Santa Madalena, and I, I left a man. But let me talk more about bathing, because it's become important to me. Um, the bathroom itself is on the second, is on the high level of the tower. And from one porthole window, you see a beautiful Tuscan landscape, mountains, valleys, the whole, the whole thing. And next to the bathtub, there is a beautiful fainting couch, I believe of Turkish provenance. So I would bathe for a few hours, and then I would slum like slither out of there. And I would see the Turkish couch, and I'd say, oh, I'm going to faint. <laughs> and I would faint. And then I would sleep for a few hours. Then I'd wake up, and I'd say, oh, but the bathtub looks so nice. And I would faint in there, too. <laughs> Days were given up to passing out. And yet, in the middle of passing out, I wrote a novel. I can't remember the name of it, but it was pretty good. <laughs> so the third book, uh, Super Whatever, uh, that I just wrote, um, a lot of it began germinating in my mind during these very long soaks. Um, because being in a warm bath, uh, well, it reminds me of a family in a way I never really thought of family. But also being with Beatrice reminds me of family. We, we just went to Colombia together. I'd never take my real family there. They're insane. You know? <laughs> but Beatrice is family, and, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, so this is a scene I'll read of that was written in the bathtub, and it's a family scene. It's from Super Sad. Um, it's, this is set um, in the future, but just um, a completely illiterate America is about to fall apart, so next Wednesday or something. Uh, and it's a scene where a, a gentleman who's in his uh, late 30s, a Russian-American Jew, where do I get this stuff, right? Uh, is taking back to his house a, a young a Korean girl named Eunice Park. She's about 15 years his younger, and they're gonna, he's going to introduce her to his family. We took, a corner to the, we took a cab to the corner of Washington Avenue in Myron, the most important corner of my life. I could already see my parents' brownish, half-brick, half-stucco cape, the golden mailbox out in front, the faux 19th century lamp beside it, the cheap lawn chair stacked on the island of cement that was supposed to be the front porch, and the gigantic flags of the United States and Israel billowing from two flagpoles. I felt a little embarrassed because I knew that Eunice's parents were much better off than mine. At the door, my mother appeared in her usual household outfit, white bra and panties. <laughs> She was about to throw her arms around my neck when she noticed Eunice let out some Russian garble of amazement and retreated inside the house, leaving me with the visuals of her thick breasts and white little round of belly. My father, shirtless, soon took her place, also gasped at Eunice, ran his hand against his naked muscular breast, said, whoa, then hugged me. There was hair against my new dress shirt, the gray carpet of hair that my father wore with an odd touch of class, as if he were a royal in some tropical country. He kissed me on both cheeks, and I did the same, feeling the instructions, the code of Russian father-son relations. Father means I have to love him, have to listen to him, can't offend him, can't hurt him, can't bring him to task for past wrongs. He's an old man now, defenseless. My mother reappeared in shorts and a wife beater. Sunochik, little son, she shouted. Look who's come to visit us. Nash Lubinitz, our favorite. She shook Eunice's hand and both of my parents swiftly evaluated her, affirmed that she was like her predecessors, not Jewish, but <laughs> quietly approved of the fact that she was thin and attractive with a healthy black mane of hair. My mother unwrapped her own precious blonde locks from the green handkerchief that kept them safe from the American sun and smiled prettily at Eunice. She began talking in her brave post-retirement English about how glad she was to have a potential daughter-in-law, filling in the contours of her loneliness 
with rapid-fire questions about my mysterious life in faraway New York City. Does Lenny keep clean house? Does he vacuum? Once I come to college dormitorium, oh, awful, such smell, dead ficus tree, old cheese on table, socks hanging in window. <laughs> Eunice smiled and spoke in my favor. He's like very good, Mrs. Abrama, she said. He's like very clean. <laughs> I looked at her with love. A protagonist from the discount pharmacy, I said to my father, taking five boxes out of the bag I brought. Thank you, morning, Kate, little one, my father said, taking hold of his beloved drug. It's peptic ulcer, he said to Eunice, pointing at the depth of his tortured stomach. My mother had already crapped up and grabbed hold of the back of my head and was madly stroking my hair. So gray, she said. So old he gets. Almost 40. Really, what is happening to you? Too much stress? Also losing hair. Oh, my God. <laughs> You are named Eunice, my father said. Do you know where it comes from, such name? Like my parents? Eunice came up again. No, no, not parents. It's from Greek, unike, meaning victorious. He laughed, happy to demonstrate that before he was forced to be a janitor in America, he had served as a quasi-intellectual and very minor dandy on Moscow's Arbat Street. So I hope, he said, that in life you will be victorious also. <laughs> Who cares about Greek Boris? My mother said, look at how she's beautiful. The fact that my parents admired Eunice's looks and capacity for victory brightened me quite a bit. <laughs> All these years, and I still crave their approval, still long for the carrot and stick of their 19th century child rearing. I instructed myself to lower the heat of my emotions, to think without the family blood bursting at the temples, but I was 12 years old as soon as I passed the mezuzah at the front door. My father began to lead me to the living room couch for our usual heart-to-heart. -heart. My mother rushed over the couch with a garbage bag, which she draped over the place where I was about to sit in my compromised Manhattan outerwear. She took Eunice to the kitchen, chatting gaily to her potential daughter-in-law about how guys can be so dirty, you know, and how she had just built a new storage device for her mini mops. On the couch, my father draped his arm around my shoulder and said, No, расскажи, so tell me. I breathed in the same breath as he did, as if we were connected. I felt his age seep into mine as if he were the foreguard of my own mortality. I spoke in English with the tantalizing hints of Russian I had studied haphazardly at NYU, the foreign words like raisins shining out of a loaf. I spoke about work, about my assets, about the most recent fairly positive valuation of my 740 square foot Manhattan apartment, about all the monetary things that kept us fearful and connected. The floor beneath my feet was clean, immigrant clean, clean enough so that you understood that some woman had done her best. My father had two old-fashioned television screens stapled to the wall above my mother's fanatically waxed mantelpiece. In this future, there's only two stations left in the country, uh, Fox Liberty Prime and Fox Liberty Ultra. <laughs> One television was set to a Fox Liberty Prime stream, which was showing the growing tent city in Central Park, now spreading from the backyard of the Metropolitan Museum over Hill and Dale, all the way down to the Sheep's Meadow. On the other screen, Fox Liberty Ultra was viciously broadcasting the arrival of the Chinese central banker at Andrews Air Force Base, our president and his pretty wife, trying not to shiver in the bleak Maryland downpour. Thank you. Um, and the last reader is Michael Cunningham who's the author of the novels uh, A Home at the End of the World, Flesh and Blood, The Hours, which won the Penn Faulkner Award and the Pulitzer Prize, Specimen Days, and By Nightfall. He lives in New York. Uh, 